Welcome to The Table Podcast, where we discuss issues of God and culture, brought to you by Dallas Theological Seminary. And then here's the interesting thing about the Indiana law that I think most people don't get. And that is, even as originally written and even, I think, as amended, and that is that really all the Indiana law does is establish the right of a person to make a religious liberty defense. Isn't that correct? I mean, they don't... Yeah, that's the, 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 the thing that I think has really gotten sort of blown out of proportion is that this, this idea, and, and the other side has kind of – has done, a, 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 I think, an unfair uh, job of mischaracterizing. It doesn't mean you win when you assert every time, mm-hmm. and like it is a defense. And so, and I take this, and I and, and it, you know, it's real. If we were my, let's say we converted and we became Mayan, mm-hmm. okay, you and, we're now Mayan, and we're going to practice the Mayan religion uh, um, or the Aztec religion. Any religion that does human sacrifice, right, pick, right, pick, pick, right. pick, pick, pick your religion. So we decide, you know, we think we're, we're going to convert. We're going to be in what we'd say in America, okay? Mm-hmm. Well, freedom of religion. Now, does that give us a right to engage in human sacrifice? Does that that that, that would be our because that's our sincerely held religious belief, I and mean, that's the test. The test is: is this sincere? Well, my religion. You know, and actually, it's been a stab. This is what we believe. Does that give us a belief to to do that? No. This the law, and just like the founders envisioned the way the law was for over a hundred years in America, it it, it it's a test. Mm-hmm. There's a balancing test. It's a standard that's applied that it's has to be met. And so the first thing, I mean, if you look at this law, just like the federal law uh, that, that was passed in 1993, the law in Indiana, the law in Texas, the law in 20 states says the first thing, the first thing that courts look at when someone feels their religious liberty is being somehow infringed, first thing the court looks at is says, is this substantially burdening a sincerely held religious belief? Substantial burden. That's mm-hmm. the first thing. And so the person who, who who is arguing that my rights are being somehow violated has to demonstrate it's a substantial burden. Mm-hmm. Then, and even when they do that, doesn't mean they win. Mm-hmm. Then the government comes forward and says, and then in my case of human sacrifice, mm-hmm. we would use that. But in the case of any public safety tor- sort of situation, would say, all right. Does the government have a compelling interest? Now, again, that's a legal term, mm-hmm. term that has been in the legal vernacular for over 100 years. What it really means is, does the government have a really good reason? Mm-hmm. It's not a made-up reason. It's a good reason. Mm-hmm. Uh, there are some tests in the law that are called rational basis. That just means if the government has a reason, they don't have to be really good, just a reason, then that's good enough. Here, it's a little more than that. It's a higher standard. Yeah, it's a higher standard. It has to be a really good reason. And with that really good reason, is it using the only way it can in order to accomplish that? Mm -hmm. Now, that standard should be really familiar for a lot of people, especially if you've done a show on Hobby Lobby, because that's the standard that the court looked at in the Hobby Lobby case. That's all Indiana, and at its core, Mm -hmm. when you look at the core parts, that's all the Indiana law does. It says says to the person who feels that their rights are violated, you get the right to assert that your rights are violated, and then we go through the standard practice of determining whether the state's compelling interest has been uh, sacrificed in, in in forcing you to go there, and that's and that's a judicial judgment that's made. Is that right? That's right. And and you know we've got because we you know we've had since ninety three the federal law, but before that we had a body of law that talks about. So you look, you're able to look at different situations. You make so vaccinations, for mm-hmm. instance. I mean, so, oh my word, we're gonna, you know, and now every well, no, you have to take that balancing test. And actually, the Hobby Lobby case, that was the argument. I said, well, but if you rule in favor of Hobby Lobby, then you're opening the you're opening Pandora's box. No, judges have routinely. I mean, we're taught in law school. You routinely they have to apply the test. It's a fact, case by case analysis. And so mm-hmm. we're going to look at vaccinations. And, and what I tell people is, look, I don't know how the court would handle that case, but I know what the analysis would be. Mm-hmm. First, it would be, do you have a sincerely held religious belief mm-hmm. that's being substantially burdened? Mm-hmm. So it can't be just, I wake up one morning and I don't like vaccinations. Yeah. You'd have to be part of a religious belief system. Mm-hmm. that obje- And there are. Mm-hmm. I mean, I recognize yeah. that. Yeah. But you just couldn't be just willy-nilly. And then from that, does the government have a compelling interest to substantially burden that. Well, I, I could see a lot of judges and ultimately the Supreme Court saying 
that that they do have a compelling interest, and there's no because other way. Because of the public health. Threat. Because of the public health threat. Yeah. And 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 you know the court gets to make that determination. Let me, give, let me give you another one that you mentioned to me when we were off the air that I think is interesting, uh, and and it's the the Amish right to use the public thoroughfares because we the the human sacrifice one is kind of out yeah, there. Yeah, that's a little so. out there. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but, I don't know. I haven't met too many Mayan or Aztecs exactly lately. Exactly right. <laughs> okay. So, but the but the Amish one, if you live in Pennsylvania, that's a real one. You're going to yeah. run into that. So I was so, just there. So so. Uh, uh, what 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 does that one look like? Yeah, no, and that's the thing. There's a there's a case called Yoder, Yoder versus Sherbert, but it's to do with the Amish. So take the case of Amish being in their their buggies. Mm-hmm. Um, they want to use public highways, mm-hmm. right? And originally the, the Amish said, "Well, we don't want to put reflectors on ours. Mm-hmm. We don't want to do that." Mm-hmm. You know, but that that didn't. So they argued that, and the government said, "No, we have a compelling interest for safety. Mm-hmm. Now we're going to let you on the roads, mm-hmm. but you're going to have to do certain things to be on the roads. You're going to mm-hmm. have to put reflectors on there. Mm-hmm. You know, you're going to put the, the the lights. You're not going to drive at night. I mean, there are going to be certain restrictions, and, and courts have said that, that that that's fine. They don't have. It's not just you can't use religious liberty as a trump card. Mm-hmm. And religious it's liberty not automatic. It, no." No, yeah. not at all, and they don't win every case, mm-hmm. nor should it win every case, mm-hmm. and that's and that's what's great. You know, with the founders, and they understood that, and that was the law. And you know, a, a colleague of mine says, "Well, you want to blame all this? We blame it on Justice Scalia, hmm. because it goes back to a decision. I mean, this was the law. We wouldn't need these statutes mm-hmm. in the states or in the federal government had not the Supreme Court decided a case in 1990 hmm. uh, called Employment Division versus Smith, hmm. uh, and." And in that case, Justice Scalia writes the majority opinion, and, and, and what he holds is if it's a law of general applicability, then it's fine, and we don't get into religious – we don't get into the issue of religious. We don't even have to have to balance. Hmm. Now, I would submit to you that case was wrongly decided – and I love Justice Scalia, uh-huh. but he was wrong on that, and, mm-hmm. I, and I honestly believe that – if he had that case again today, knowing what would have happened, he wouldn't have ruled the way he did. But actually, in that case, it was the conservatives mm-hmm. who ruled against the religious person mm-hmm. and said that, no, it, it, it was a law of general applicability. It means it's a law applies to everybody. Mm-hmm. We don't want to hear about your religion. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, and so if it's a general, general neutral law, then we don't get into this religious analysis. Now, us again, submit to you that it, that was – inconsistent with how we understood free exercise in our country, what the founders understood free exercise to be. It's inconsistent with cases from the 40s and the 50s interpreting religious liberty. And so what Congress did then after after that decision, they passed the Religious Freedom Restoration Act, hmm. which reinstated the test that had been there before. So they went back because of the decision to get back to where they were. Exactly, and that's exactly that's exactly what they did in 1993. And the thing that that, that that's neat about 1993 was this was a huge bipartisan. Oh yeah, effort. something like 93 to something. Yeah, 97 I mean, yeah. to three yeah, in the yeah, Senate. Yeah, yeah. 97 to three in the Senate, signed by President Clinton. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, supported by Senator Kennedy, mm-hmm. uh, drafted by. Then Representative Schumer, uh, Chucky uh, Schumer, uh, and you know you had a broad support. You had the ACLU supporting it. Mm-hmm. You had um, conservative groups supporting it. I mean, just broad support. No one in 1993 would have come out and said, except the extreme on both sides, coming out saying we're against religious liberty and religious freedom. Mm. And they and because it was the federal a federal law. They could only say against the federal government. It did not apply to the states. And so what you then had from 1993 on, you had states adopting their own versions, Texas being one of them. Mm-hmm. Texas is a, has adopted one. Mm-hmm. And you know, in Texas, it passed in the late 90s. We've had at Liberty Institute, actually Kelly Shackelford was involved in the first case at the Texas Supreme Court. Mm-hmm. It involved a city trying to restrict a prison ministry, a, a halfway house, mm-hmm. from the city limits. Mm-hmm. Supreme Court court took that case and said no that but by banning them from that from the city you're you're infringing on their religious liberty but it wasn't simply oh we have religion. no the, the court did about the ba- did the balancing test so this this law that we're talking about in 1993 is entitled and I'm trying to remember is it the religious what is it the, the religious Re- freedom restoration, restoration act. act so raf rafra basically we or? call it we call it rifra rifra okay yeah we call it rifra religious freedom restoration act okay and and that's what everybody's talking 
talking about when they say these laws are mirroring or at least attempting to mirror these with with the changes that have come in place. Okay, now let's get down to the brass tacks. We got 20 minutes left, and 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 really, what it seems to me we're down to now is is a tension. The tension between the rights that an individual has to be a citizen and exercise the rights and choices that the law gives them, and of course with the law shifting in the area of same-sex marriage, we have people now in certain states who have the right to get married, uh, to marry someone of the same gender. With the uh, with with the choice that they have about what services they they procure for the for that, and then the, and then the option the service provider has for whether or not in giving that service they are violating their conscience or not. So the, so I, I can I'm going to try and lay this out as neutrally as I know how to describe it. From the same sex perspective, the idea is I have a right to get married. The state recognizes that right to get married. I ought to be able to get the cake and the flowers and the pictures that I want for my marriage. It's a completely legal act, and any refusal to do that is discriminatory against me. From the provider's standpoint, the idea is, but the moment you ask me to do that, you're asking me, in effect, to endorse something that I find morally objectionable for on religious grounds, and that's discriminatory against me. So when, when I've got when I've got dual discrimination going on, what do I do? It, well, it, it it's it's constitutional interpretation, and it's a clash. Although, I think it's important that to to, to first off, you go back to what. The law, and so how would it come up in in, in the context? Mm-hmm. Uh, and if in the version originally passed by Indiana, the version passed by Arkansas, and 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 take Texas for instance, um, you have someone who goes into an establishment, and um, they're told, "I'm not going to service you." Mm-hmm. Then, and we've had this with florists, and we've had this with photographers, and I think we've had this with, with, um, with um, cake, ba- cake, ba- with bakeries. Okay. Right. We've had wedding venues in in other states, mm-hmm. um, and and things. All right now, uh, all of the cases. Relate upon relate to some sort of participation in the marriage ceremony, where the person providing the service actually, in, in some sense, is actively engaged in contributing to the service, and somehow it, expressing perhaps artistic ability, adding to it, mm-hmm. um, and and I think and I think that's important because it, this is not an ability to in every situation refuse service because of someone's sexual orientation. Mm-hmm. Um, it, 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 is, it is a basis to say, I'm not – government, you cannot compel me mm-hmm. to participate in an activity that violates my religious beliefs. And my religious conscience. And, and, and this is something that when we think about it, we, we've seen this before, and this came up mm-hmm. in a different context in the 60s and the 70s, mm-hmm. when the government was drafting people, mm-hmm. and, they were, and they, were, they were saying, you're going to go into the Army. Mm-hmm. And they said, no, I have, I have a conscientious objection. So this is the pacifism objection. And I do not want, I do not want to participate. Mm-hmm. In, in, in something that I believe is illegal, something that I believe is immoral, something that violates my beliefs. Mm-hmm. And through that process, we then established in this country an idea that we were going to give people the right to have conscientious objection to, th- to not force them to violate their beliefs. And so when I look at this issue and mm-hmm. I think of the florist mm-hmm. and, I, and I think of the baker and the photographer, what we really have is the government coming in and saying, can the government compel someone that they, in order to be in business, mm-hmm. They have to participate in an activity that they have a sincerely held religious belief against, and 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 I think that then that that that, that that's how that, that's how you have to kind of look at it because it's a conscientious objection. That's something that the First Amendment is a core principle. Again, as as we talked about earlier, mm-hmm. not just freedom to believe, mm-hmm. it's freedom to. Act on those beliefs also, and and so when you ask the florist, you ask the baker to actually participate in an activity 
that they disagree with. And again, you know, Kelly Shackelford and I were at the Hobby Lobby argument, actually mm-hmm. sitting on the front row, and we both gave a double take at, at one point during the argument. And it's when the Solicitor General of the United States argued that because Hobby Lobby had entered into business, that somehow they they lose their religious liberty rights. Mm-hmm. Well, that's really the same argument that we're hearing now today. Mm-hmm. That if you want to be, I mean, the latest being this, this, I mean, and this one, it, to me, it, one of the most outrageous casualties of the of the recent Indiana debate is this pizzeria mm-hmm. who doesn't even cater weddings, mm-hmm. but some journalist says, "Well, well, would you? You know, would you cater again?" Mm-hmm. Well, that's never happened, and then the journalist, being a journalist, then presses the issue. Well, but would you? No, we, we wouldn't do that. We, that violator bliss. Results, I mean, they've been, because of threats, they've been forced out of business. Mm-hmm. Now, they weren't saying they, they would refuse you know, a gay person from buying a slice of pizza. Mm-hmm. I mean, that they'd even know that the person was gay unless they told them, mm-hmm. right? It's not like race, right. where you can look at someone and you can determine, you know, and then we that. So that has nothing to do with that. Uh, but you have the, I mean, that, that they somehow, but they just answered a question and they're a casualty of, of, of this. So I think the whole issue is, is government compulsion. Are we going to, in order to be in business, you have to violate your religious beliefs. And this compelling standard idea is another interesting part of the argument, it seems to me, because I do think that another reply can be, it isn't like this couple can't find a baker, uh, a florist, or a photographer to take pictures at their wedding. They don't have to go into one where they know the person objects. Um, you know, well, and that's the thing about the florist um, in, 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 in her situation. What we know is, one, she had served this person before, mm-hmm. the, the, the gay individual, and she, what she had said is, I just – I can't participate in your wedding. Here are some florists who will. Mm-hmm. So, I mean, so yeah. she said other people, she had served them before. Mm-hmm. She thought, I mean, actually said that it had sort of the, a friendship. Yeah. And she's just saying, but I can't participate in something that I think is, you know, that violates my, my deeply held religion. But again, it isn't a license. You have to go through and go through the analysis. You first have to demonstrate not everyone will get this ability. You have to – you assert it as a defense, again, by the government compelling you. Mm-hmm. And then what you determine is if the law had been passed as written, the law like it is for the federal government, mm-hmm. it would be something you got to show, again, substantial burden, sincerely held religious belief, and then the government can come forward with it. It's part and, of the case. And so it seems to me – I'm going to go back to, to kind of where we started, which is if you design a government that's supposed to uh, that's supposed to honor diversity. And it also is supposed to create a society in which there's a recognition that there are diverse views. And there's certainly – I don't think anyone walking into a court of law today would have difficulty making the argument. And the issue of same-sex marriage is socially controversial. <laughs> I, I, you know, I, 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 I don't think you'd have to work very hard to establish that. Um, it, is, it is an area where there are diverse views that exist, and, that, and, and there are – there's a history of, of religious discussion around it as well. Um, so, so in trying to balance the right of the gay person to have access to all the services they want when they have a wedding, which is certainly they would something they would still have, versus compelling the person who has religious objection to participate in that, it's, it seems to me that if you applied these standards, you can make a pretty good case that you can get all the services you want. The discrimination that you're talking about, if it exists, is extremely selective. Um, but the but the compulsion of asking someone to participate in an act that they view would be an affirmation of something they actually view as immoral is a violation of conscience and is a violation of core amendment rights. It seems to me that that's how you'd balance this out. No, it's exactly how you do it. And I take it take it out of the gay issue mm-hmm. and 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 let's let's talk about a different a different example because if the government can compel you mm-hmm. to violate your religious beliefs, then what are some other areas? Let, let's think about the kosher deli. Mm-hmm. Could let's take New York. Mm-hmm. Right? There's some great kosher delis, I'm sure. Oh, in yeah, New absolutely. York, right? Yep, there are tons of them. <laughs> yeah, and so could could if 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 in their wisdom the city of New York decided, you know, we don't want kosher. We want delis to offer everything. Mm-hmm. So we want we want all delis to offer everything, mm-hmm. include kosher and non-kosher. Mm-hmm. Now, could they compel a kosher deli to carry non-kosher items? That's a good argument. 
And, 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 and you know, of course not. Mm-hmm. Of course not. And, you know, it goes back again. I mean, and you started talking about the Hobby Lobby. The Hobby Lobby case is important because these same issues that came up. Because, I mean, could the government – can, can the government force you to eat broccoli? That's right. I mean, can they, and if you don't, are you going to pay a tax or fine, depending on what Chief Justice Roberts decides? Um, but you know, can it compel? You know, no. I mean, it, you cannot force people to violate their religious. And, and I like I like the idea because in the law, on in the employment context, we have something called accommodation. Mm-hmm. And there was a case this last term argued in, involving um, uh, Abercrombie and Fitch. A young lady uh, uh, applied for a job. Abercrombie and Fitch has a policy that you're not an employment policy. We won't let our they call their all their employees models. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't know if I've ever been to an Abercrombie and Fitch. <laughs> by the way, I feel like I should since yeah. I know about My this case. My wife won't go there for partially for this yeah, reason. Yeah, I but think go they've got some. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah, but they call their employees yeah. models. I yeah. do know that, and they so a young. A uh, woman interviewed for a job she had on her uh, hijab mm-hmm. uh, during it. She scores really high, but then, then you know, I often tell when I was in the corporate world, when you're corporate people, do not put these type of things in emails. But apparently their email correspondence back and forth was saying, well, yeah, but she was wearing this thing on her head. Mm-hmm. You know, we can't have that because mm-hmm. we have a policy. So the issue that the Supreme Court is presented with, and she didn't get the job. She's actually, she scored the highest, and then they downgraded her mm-hmm. because she had a hijab. Mm-hmm. And because of her Muslim faith, she mm-hmm. wanted to she needs to wear that mm-hmm. in her otherwise would have gotten it. So the question is, can they accommodate mm-hmm. that belief? Mm-hmm. And and the court's going to let us know. Now, mm-hmm. based upon the oral, oral argument, I think the young lady's going to win mm-hmm. because the justice is looking at, well, you know, really did, you know, they did, who has to ask? Lots of different issues. But in the employment context, we've often said that if your employer's asking you to violate your religious beliefs. First off, the employer has to know that they're violating mm-hmm. it. Mm-hmm. Then it's then it goes back. You don't just because they are doesn't mean you win. Then it goes back, sort of like this balancing test again. It goes back for the employer to demonstrate. Well, you know, look, we're only. I have to have people work on Sunday. Mm-hmm. You only have three employees. We mm-hmm. take turns. They have to work. Mm-hmm. And so if they can't do that, then they can't work here. Mm-hmm. You know, even though that might they may believe that mm-hmm. they shouldn't work on Sunday. Um, but for a large employer, mm-hmm. maybe you can accommodate. Mm. And I really think when you think of the florist and the baker, I mean, they can be accommodated. Mm -hmm. I mean, this isn't a case that these people were not going to get – they weren't going to get their wedding. Mm -hmm. They weren't going to have their cake. Right. They They weren't going to have their cake and eat it, too. Not at all. (laughs) I almost said it, but I'll let you say say it. Um, But that that wasn't the case, that you could accommodate those. I mean, I think we're going to see this in other areas. We're going to see it with county clerks. Mm -hmm. Um, There there, there are certainly – if the Supreme Court goes the way many of us believe and that mm-hmm. they find that in the 14th Amendment that there is a right to same-sex marriage, mm-hmm. then county clerks are going to be asked to issue licenses, and they're going to be faced with, do, do I resign mm-hmm. um, or do I follow the law? Mm-hmm. Or perhaps in some places there'll be, other, there'll be enough clerks that there are some clerks who will don't. Will sign and others won't. won't but again, won't, it, goes, yeah. it goes back to – and it, it not every – I mean, it goes back to you're going to have to demonstrate this is your sincerely held religious beliefs. And again, this is about – on these issues, we're talking about marriage. Mm-hmm. This is something that the majority of Americans believe in, tradi- believe in traditional marriage mm-hmm. uh, and something that for thousands of years, the three main faith traditions – all believe in marriage between one man and one woman. Um, I, I, you know, I. It, the, they can't That's where I started. That's why I held. said I don't think you're going to have difficulty saying this is a controversial area that is, you know. Uh, and and the thing, you know, but you know, but we're seeing. I mean, I know in cases right now on my docket, I've got men and women who've lost their jobs mm-hmm. in the private sector. Because of their beliefs concerning traditional marriage. Well, the famous case in that regard is the what the Atlanta police, the, La- the Atlanta, Atlanta police, police chief, chief, and we've yeah. got four others. I mean, Craig James, with, mm-hmm. which people in in the Dallas area will yep. know. Yeah, on mean, ESPN. He, he, well, fired from Fox Sports. Yeah, Fox Sports, Fox Sports, right. Sports yeah. because his views. Yeah, I've got a, a, a PhD, MD, Doctor of Public Health, Eric Walsh, fired from the state of Georgia because they went. Believe it, believe this. You don't worry. Go to the secular. I mean, to the uh, yeah, the secular workplace because they'll review. 
review your sermons. Mm. Did you know that? That's what yeah. they did with Dr. Walsh. Dr. Walsh is a lay minister, mm -hmm. and lo and behold, he had preached about traditional marriage. Mm. That makes him unqualified to work for the state of Georgia, apparently. Mm. And mm. so, I mean, I, these issues are coming up, and what we've been talking about at Liberty Institute, we see it a clash. It's a clash of absolutes. You've got religious freedom, mm -hmm. which for over 200 years we believe in this country we've respected as a core foundational freedom versus this new sexual orthodoxy. Mm -hmm. And unfortunately, uh, on, on the other side, it, it they seem to be taking a winner-take-all approach. Mm -hmm. uh, and you know, you can't go I, – I, in if you read the New York Times, for instance, I mean, the idea is you know, religious liberty can't win. I mean, the disturbing thing is on the national level, the person who's now in charge of the equal opportunity uh, Employment Commission, the EEOC, is is a former professor named uh, Chai Feldblum, Feldblum, and she was asked, recognizing this clash, she was saying, when there's a clash between religious liberty and sexual orthodoxy, this new sexual orthodoxy, um, can you imagine a time ever where religious freedom would win? And she answered honestly, and she said, "No, I can't imagine." Yeah, a situation. I even think the language is poor because because the issue is not a, an issue of one side winning or the other. It's not an. This is not. If we're talking about a, we're back to the principle of if we're talking about a diverse society in which there are differences of views, and we're trying to figure out how can we live together. And you know, I like the legal language. How can we accommodate one another to a certain degree? Then it's not going to be a matter of me getting everything I want and you getting everything you want. It's going to be a matter of trying to sort out how we can coexist with one another despite the differences in worldview that we have. And and trying to figure out what that is that impinges on everybody the least, if I can say it that way, might be a better path to seek than for each side to seek absolute victory. Um, well, I think that's right. I mean, again, religious liberty doesn't win in every case, nor should it. Mm -hmm. uh, and. You know, before 1990 and before the Employment Division versus Smith case, that's the balancing test we had. Mm -hmm. That's what these laws, at its core, you know, that's what these laws are trying to do is reinstate that balancing test. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's not to put a thumb down on one side or the other. Uh, unfortunately, I think that now the the, the, the knee jerk reaction has been. To yeah, put the that cultural thumb. way this has been framed really gets us off. This is why I wanted to spend so much time on the legal side of this, because to me, if you understand legally what has been attempted and what the history of this conversation has been, it, is, it isn't as all or nothing as the public debate has been. And this is one of the ways in which our public debate sometimes doesn't serve us very well. Uh, in, in fact, it's almost disturbing how, how unaware the public discussion is of these kinds of standards and the way they're applied and really, to some degree, what motivated their establishment to begin with so that we do develop some mutual sensitivity to one another. Well, I think that's important. And what I've been telling people, and, and, and certainly when I've been talking about this uh, these issues publicly is I, I tell them about the stories of the people that these laws have protected. Mm -hmm. uh, we represented in Mississippi a small African American church, so Mississippi, mm -hmm. small African American church who had found a downtown location to expand into. Mm -hmm. And the city there, believe it or not, had a law that said in order for a church to occupy the downtown area of its town, and, and it specifically said church, mm -hmm. in order for a church to occupy the downtown, it had to gain 60 percent support of the adjoining landowners in the downtown area, and then the mayor had to approve it. Hmm. Well, guess what? That violates the law, mm -hmm. and that 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 is a substantial burden mm -hmm. because they couldn't. I mean, they couldn't even find some of the the things. So you could have a pool hall mm -hmm. in downtown mm -hmm. Holly Springs, Mississippi. Mm -hmm. You could have a liquor store in downtown Holly Springs, Mississippi, mm -hmm. but you couldn't have a church. Mm -hmm. uh, and so the small African American church. I mean that. I mean, it, they were done. Mm -hmm. uh, but fortunately, we were able to go there, and, I, and I, we obviously thought, well, the city, when we show them this violates the law, mm -hmm. we'll fix it. But uh, no, we ended up going all the way to the Fifth Circuit Court of Appeals, so that's the court right below the U.S. Supreme Court mm -hmm. that covers our area in Mississippi and getting a landmark precedent. But it was one of these laws, and it was a sister to RIFRA called RELUPA mm -hmm. that applies to land use and protects churches and synagogues and other places of worship in land use decisions. But it's the same standard in the same test. Mm -hmm. And so these laws, I mean, that Afri and that church today exists because we we're able to use that to protect them. But you know, whether it's a Jewish synagogue or an African American church, I mean, these laws protect real people who are involved in real disputes and and who 
you, for whatever reason, you have governmental ent entities um, uh, trying to take advantage of or to discriminate against. Well, Jeff, I really appreciate you taking the time to be this. Tell us a little bit about how people can find out about the Liberty Institute. Yeah, best way to go find out about Liberty Institute is at www.libertyinstitute.org, and you hear about all our cases that we're working on and the battles to protect religious liberty and in America. Are, are there resources available there to help people get located in these kinds of conversations? Yeah, if you're a school, if you're a church, if you're involved in these issues, we've got lots of downloads, and mm -hmm. they can see that at libertyinstitute.org. Great. Well, I really appreciate you coming in to help us walk through this. Obviously, this is an ongoing discussion, and I, I think this is a case where I, 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 there's a credit to the law. I mean, I think the law has really tried to make an effort to balance out the tensions of living in this kind of diverse society in which we're a part of, and if we would respect the way the law has been has been crafted because of uh, of the way these conversations have taken place over a long period of time, if we respect that, we might actually be able to figure out a way to to deal with all this. I hope so. I yeah. hope so. And it, 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 I guess it's going to play out over the next few months and years. Yeah. Well, thank you again for being a part of us, and thank you for being a part of the table where we discuss issues of God and culture, and we look forward to seeing you again soon. Thanks for listening to The Table Podcast. For more podcasts like this one, visit dts.edu slash the table. Dallas Theological Seminary. Teach truth. Love well. Love well.